Great, thank you, Howard. And uh, I'm excited to be here. The game plan for today is basically because my measure is not as famous as Monica's. Uh, I thought I would just sort of sketch the outlines of that model um, and give you a, a, a series of, of findings using that particular uh, measure. So I won't be talking about a particular study. Um, but what I'd like to do is, uh, our current study is looking at uh, narratives of trauma. And I think it's really important that uh, we ground wisdom in real life experiences um, as opposed to you know, exclusively or only uh, laboratory work. So here are some opening sentences from narratives in the current study. I won't go through them all. Uh, my mother and father are constantly fighting. Second one, she tried to kill herself but couldn't bring herself to do it. When I was in grade 10, I was bullied. The last day of summer, my grandmother suffered from stroke. He's always uh, drank since the day I was born, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, these are the types of issues that call for wisdom. It's not, uh, you know, what sort of salad dressing we put on at lunchtime. And I think that's in, that's in part why wisdom is so rare. It's not everyday events that require it. It's relatively difficult life experiences. So we'll come back to that because that is actually one of the elements of, of wisdom, at least according to this particular model. All right, with that sort of background in mind then, uh, let me give you a, a definition. Um, the competence to intentionally apply insights from critical life experiences to facilitate optimal development in self and others. And in this definition, it captures uh, several components that uh, I'll just quickly uh, mention. So clearly there's the cognitive element in wisdom. It's different from just strictly intelligence, but you have to have a minimal level of, of intelligence to sift through and parse through the different components of difficult life experiences. Tensionality, wise people intend their actions to have particular outcomes that are helpful to themselves. Um, and the application. If you, have the, if you have the competence and the, and the intention, but you don't do it, that's just a New Year's Eve resolution that hasn't been uh, realized. So I think the, uh, the action component of wisdom is, is a historical uh, aspect as well. Uh, and then apply those insights from critical life experiences, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment, um, to facilitate optimal development. So we've heard uh, well, about uh, hedonistic pursuits and eudaimonia, so uh, purpose and meaning in life would be sort of optimal types of considerations. Uh, development, that's something we haven't talked about in this uh, seminar so far, uh, the notion that how wisdom may develop and change over time um, uh, in, in self, but also in others. So this is sort of the Sternberg's balance sort of notion, and it gets us away from simply people that are really sort of sly or crafty, but they're concerned about the welfare of other individuals with their intentional decisions. So that's the, my definition of wisdom, and to be true or fair or honest, I suppose my measure is actually getting at characteristics of wise individuals. Um, it doesn't tap into the definition directly. So the studies I'll tell you about at the end are meant to convey that people that are wise people do wise uh, things. All right, so uh, wisdom then is uh, conceptualized in this particular model as a sort of a synthetic combination of, of five elements. Uh, the self-assessed wisdom scale is a 40-item questionnaire. It has five factors, which I'll briefly mention. Uh, and there's eight questions per factor. Uh, so this has all the problems of personality questionnaires that have been uh, <laughs> identified. So I'm just going to throw myself on the mercy of the court. These are, these are correlational findings, and so we have to take them with a grain of salt or you know, a bag of salt. Um, all right, so uh, hence the hero, I was a little bit cheeky because Judith had a, an acronym, so I wanted to have an acronym <laughs> as well. Uh, and uh, here's the five dimensions. They're only in order of the acronym, not of importance. Um, all right. Well, the first one is uh, humor, and this is not the one, did you hear the one about the priest, the rabbi, and the nun going into the bar type of uh, notion? Um, it's the recognition of life's uh, ironies and a well-developed sense of affiliative humor, um, ability and willingness to make others feel comfortable, use of humor as a mature uh, coping strategy. There's other components to that. So wise people are able to uh, use uh, their sense of humor to um, actually connecting to other elements in the model, self-regulate. So when you're feeling upset, um, you can use humor to make yourself feel a little bit more confident uh, if you have to address a talk to wisdom experts. Um, and here's some <laughs> items from the questionnaire itself. There's nothing amusing about difficult life situations. At this point in my life, I find it hard to laugh at my mistakes. These are obviously reverse scored items. 
Okay, so there would be eight items for this particular scale. Um, emotional regulation, um, exposure to and appropriate regulation of the full spectrum of human emotions, an ability to distinguish among subtle mixed emotions, and acceptance of and openness to both positive and negative affective states. So look at the counseling literature, um, sort of Roger's model, the notion that people who are wise are not afraid to experience negative emotions if it's appropriate, um, and to express positive emotions in the uh, uh, right context. So it's this notion of, this also shows you how this ties into to openness, for instance. So openness to um, feelings as well. Um, and we've heard some prior talks about how um, when you are in a difficult situation, like the ones I posted at the beginning of the talk, if you're able to sort of uh, modify your mood, move yourself away from a deep depression or from anxiety or, for, or towards happiness or joy in the moment or whatever it is, that to, be, to me would be a, an element, a key or a core component of what we mean by wisdom. Uh, people that can't do that at the extreme would have alexithymia. Okay, people that just aren't, can't identify their emotions and just can't manipulate them to uh, their advantage as well as others. Uh, the third component we've also seen in other talks in Judas and uh, even in uh, Valerie's talk about reminiscence and reflection. This is not a type of ruminative bitterness uh, going over and over the same mistakes, but rather reflectiveness as it pertains to one's personal past uh, using memories to maintain identity, connect the past with the present, and gain perspective using autobiographical memories as a coping strategy. So wise people are able to, if you have an upcoming job interview, for instance, and you're able to remember three years ago when you had something like that, you can sort of marshal coping resources, particular strategies that you used in the past, uh, use that to help you solve a problem in the present. That would be sort of a wise uh, thing to do. Um, and uh, sort of continuity of self um, is another aspect of that as well. If I were to tweak the model, I would probably add more sort of present-oriented reflection. So not exclusively past, but what's going on right now. Maybe that ties into some of the mindfulness talks uh, that we've come across already. Uh, fourthly, openness to experience, uh, openness to ideas, values, and experiences, particularly those which may be different from one's own, willingness to sample novelty, appreciation of multiple perspectives which may be controversial, and certainly tolerance uh, of others. Um, this is not exactly the same as the uh, NEO openness because uh, although it's correlated with it, it's uh, different from that. And then finally, uh, critical life experiences. Uh, these are rich and varied experiences in interpersonal contexts, particularly those requiring resolution of difficult life choices, coping with important life transitions, exposure to life's darker side like hypocrisy and dishonesty. I should say that, that wise people have joyful experiences and have peak experiences, but we uh, have to evaluate, spend more time to understand negative experiences. If something bad goes wrong, uh, something bad happens to you, you sort of evaluate what, what, why, why that's the case. If something good happens to you, just sort of accept it and, and feel good about it. Um, all right, so just uh, some correlates of the SAWS measure. Uh, it's correlated, as you can see, with generative and ego integrity from Erickson's model, uh, psychological well-being and pro-social values, a study by Kuntzman and Baltas. I used the same uh, value measures that they used, and the, uh, the SAWS predicted those uh, the same way. Positive identity processing styles uh, and something called attributional complexity. So that ties into the, sort of the, the cognitive element, even though my questionnaire is about sort of the personality attributes. Uh, this is showing you that people who score high in that are attributionally complex, perhaps don't make the fundamental attribution error as often as other individuals, perhaps. Uh, some of these studies are done by other individuals. So benefit finding in cancer patients. So looking for the silver lining uh, in uh, medical emergencies. Positive mental health is measured by the mental health continuum. Political skill and mentoring, uh, people, the top 5%, this was a study by Moberg, top 5% or 10% of SAW scorers uh, were more likely to be mentors. I think the finding was with uh, Monica scale as well. Uh, right now, we're doing post-traumatic growth. We found that um, the SAWS predicted the post-traumatic growth inventory. Uh, forgiveness, self-efficacy, uh, and something called a balanced time perspective, which is something I'm working on now. 
optimism, positive humor styles. Um, current study under preparation uh, is looking at something called affiliative and self-enhancing humor on the humor styles questionnaire, and it is uncorrelated with aggressive humor and self-defeating humor. Uh, so that would be your discriminative type of validity uh, as well as your, your convergent validity. Uh, all right, so the, these are just questionnaire studies, paper and pencil measures, okay, so the whole host of problems. Um, it does uh, also is associated with wisdom nominees versus controls. Uh, so people who are nominated as wise tend to score higher than controls. And controls versus psychiatric patients, this is done in a study in Slovenia. Um, also in an interesting way we might talk about later. Uh, and then in terms of performance measures or measures that aren't paper and pencil, uh, it's correlated with the Berlin wisdom paradigm, but very weakly. Um, and these critical life event narratives that I've uh, published in 2013. So people were asked, we coded those for complexity, integrity, uh, and um, insight. And the SAWS predicted this, the traumatic stories that these people were telling us. Currently I have colleagues at the University of Toronto who are coding narratives of the trauma stories, and we're hoping that those things would also be predicted uh, by the SAW scale. Um, how am I doing? I got one minute left. All right. Well, that particular case, I will mention something that is not on the slide. So, what about future uh, directions? We can look at cultural differences. So, currently, um, the scale has been used with, it's been translated into Farsi. And German, Dutch, French, Korean. Uh, right now, uh, we did a confirmatory factor analysis with an Iranian sample, and the, the factors came out uh, proper, properly. Um, and as, as Ursula has mentioned several times, I mean, get beyond this uh, in terms of physiological measures, uh, which also help us talk about developmental aspects. Uh, for instance, one thing I didn't have on the slide was attachment styles. Uh, so securely attached individuals score higher in wisdom. Now, that le now, when I did the study, it was simultaneous, but theoretically, attachment happens in childhood, right? You don't get wise children. So that would be one way to sort of follow developmentally. You can, you can identify people who have a secure attachment style, follow them over time, and see how humor and emotion regulation and, those, and openness and uh, how those things sort of are modified, and then how do they come together in some synthetic way to produce wisdom. Um, what was the other one? I forget, so uh, I will just end since I, time is almost up with, bless you. I think that's from Plato. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to get brownie points for finishing before 10 minutes too, by the way. <laughs> We have a question from the webcast audience. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, your openness dimension and the NEO openness are correlated, but not the same. And this uh, webcast viewer is wondering how you would distinguish between the two. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the openness in the SAWS has more to do with sort of an internal life, emotional life, um, as opposed to like um, trying new restaurants or um, maybe some of the aesthetic qualities. Um, I haven't done an item by item comparison, but um, the correlations are strong enough to show convergent validity, but, but they're on the order of 0 0.4, 0 0.45 or something along those lines. Uh, Joel? Right here. So, so you mentioned the, the role of autobiographical knowledge and others have mentioned crystallized intelligence. Right. But I wonder if, uh, if wisdom is ever related to kind of implicit memory like uh, procedural knowledge. Can you sort of learn skills that you can apply that help <coughs> you act wisely? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, what we talked about context. So if it's the case that a procedural memory is important or efficacious in solving a particular current problem, then a, I suspect a wise person would be able to do that. I mean, I don't have any actual evidence, um, but uh, yeah, maybe if you're trying to teach a skill to a, uh, a socially anxious child and you have an implicit memory of how to you know, ride your bike properly or skateboard properly, um, then you could fall off it intentionally to use humor and then you can <laughs> show them how to do it more effectively. So it's certainly possible. 
uh, Jason, and then uh, back to Heather. I just had a real quick question for you, and you may have actually already covered this in your talk, and I might have missed it. Uh, but I was just curious, uh, to what extent are these subscales correlated with each other? Because uh, it did seem like I could imagine some of those things being pretty independent of, you know, one domain being independent of the other. Yeah, they're, they're um, moderately correlated. So, I mean, with all the studies that have been done, I can't remember all of them. But they're, uh, I think, probably range from maybe 0.4 to point. Five five or something like that. So, um, yeah, which is yeah somewhat problematic. I mean, I I haven't mentioned this, but just because that made me think about. That. I mean, my conceptualization of wisdom is that these five dimensions sort of synthesize and produce some sort of maybe novel or emergent property. Uh, that's why I like to present the full SAWS total score uh, because in isolation, humor might just mean you're the class clown, right? If you score high in critical life experiences, maybe you're just stupid. You know, you've, you've, you're making bad choices, right? Um, if you're, um, I think I'm being a little bit facetious, but yeah. So uh, um, I, I guess suspect uh, statistically, if it was a, if it's a single factor, a uh, latent factor, then the intercorrelation should be stronger. But um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Heather. So you briefly mentioned looking at time perspective. Um, yes. I'm just wondering if people who score higher on wisdom on your scale or other scales that you're familiar with are more likely to be past, present, or future oriented, because you can imagine Thank you. they reflect, Thank you. <laughs> right? The reflection could be thinking more about the past. Um, mindfulness can be more associated with being present oriented or yep. future planning goals. And Yeah. Well, that's a planted question, obviously. <laughs> I've developed a scale called the balanced time perspective scale. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's looking at a positive past, positive future, and, and Dutch colleagues have just added a present orientation subscale, which we've just published in Time and Society. And what we do find is that, yeah, wise people are in fact higher in what we call a balanced time perspective. So we, um, it, through some sort of statistical combination, we come up with a total score for the balanced time perspective. And uh, yeah, and that certainly makes sense. I mean, we've, a lot of the mindfulness talk uh, in this conference has been about, about the present, but I mean, a wise person, if you're really, if you're sort of sitting down and contemplating, you know, constantly, you're not making plans for the future. You're not concerned about, you have to pick up your autistic daughter from summer camp next week and your ex-spouse is angry at you and, and you haven't uh, evaluated your past life for, for prior strategies that you've used in those sorts of situations. So um, intuitively, um, a wise person should make use of past resources to solve problems, to feel good about themselves, to motivate them. And similarly, they should be able to anticipate the future with, uh, uh, you know, uh, for looking at eudemistic goals and things of that nature. So we, we did actually find that. Now, of course, there's an inherent confound because I just told you that one of the dimensions of the wisdom scale is, is self-reflection. So there, we did uh, take out the self-reflection component of wisdom and we ran the analysis and the results were still the same. So yeah, so a balanced time perspective uh, is predicted by the SAW scale as well. Yeah. So let me ask one last question then. Um, in the context of that particular point, do you think that people who are higher on SAWS, or do you know if people who are higher on SAWS show a difference in temporal discounting? So the, the discounting curve being shallower for wise yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Per that actually would be a sort of a performance measure that I I'm happy to have someone do. So like affective forecasting, wise people should not, uh, you know, make the types of mistakes that have been demonstrated. Although the, that research area, which I'm not really familiar with, is, they're fairly um, superficial problems. So like if your football team doesn't win the final three months from now, how sad will you feel? But if someone could come up with a way, maybe a prospective study of caregiving, for instance, how sad will you feel if your husband passes away six months from now? Um, will wise people, uh, you know, be more accurate in that sort of decision? Because Intuitively, it sounds sad, but maybe there'll be some relief because your, su your husband's been suffering for eight years with Alzheimer's, et cetera. So, I mean, if someone wants to do the study, I'd be, be happy to cheer you on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.